All right. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Hope you all had a good rest last night. Um, so it's a great honor to be here to share some of the ongoing work uh, I had with PAUSE group. And uh, first, I want to talk a little bit background of myself. Uh, so I was trained as a quantitative psychology psychologist. So my PhD degree is in quantitative psychology from University of Illinois. And my first job was in the Department of Psychology at the University of Minnesota. And Minnesota it has a long and well-known history of strength in psychometrics, uh, like uh, Paul Mio's contribution that Dan mentioned yesterday, as well as the very popular and famous uh, Minnesota Multiphasic um, Personality Inventory, MMPI. So I was very happy there to to see lots of colleagues really interested and appreciate psychometrics. So I was there for six years, but due to family reasons, I had to move. So I moved to the University of Washington and joined their College of Education. At the beginning, I felt a little lonely there because I don't see a lot of people really interested in psychometrics until, thanks to Rich, who connected me with Paul. And Paul is doing this amazing work of using advanced psychometric models uh, with uh, this ADNI data and also all kinds of cognitive battery data. Um, and that's why I was brought into PAUSE research focus and uh, collaborate with PAUSE research groups. And that's why I'm here today to share a project that we started about two years ago. And um, the, the the paper is still under review, but we got some exciting results that I really want to share with you today. Um, and since it's ongoing, and, and this is actually my first time attending this conference and talking to an audience, mostly non-psychometricians, so I'm trying to make this talk as accessible as possible. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know and I will clarify. All right, so uh, the title of the presentation is Using Bayesian IRT for Multi-Cohort Repeated Measure Design to Extract Latent Change Scores. And of course, I want to acknowledge Paul, um, um, the PI on the project, as well as my grad student, Roy Ju, and a lot of collaborators, Doug, Rich, Xiong, and Joey. And here is the outline. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about any background, but I know David is gonna elaborate that a lot in the next talk. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about our research question. Uh, and our research question in particular focused on the unique uh, design of ADNI, including the repeated measure design and multi multiple study cohorts. And then uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the simulation evidence, because as a methodologist, we use simulations as our tools to run experiments to check whether the model, whether the algorithm works. And then I'm gonna give you some conclusion discussion in the end. So uh, um, I think all of you know better of Annie than me here, because uh, Annie is a really a massive collaborative effort. Uh, to unite researchers with study data as they work to define progression of Alzheimer's disease. So it's really rich and massive data set that contains lots of information like MRI, PET images, genetics, cognitive tests, blood biomarkers, and so on. For this particular study, we focused only on uh, cognitive tests. And um, we are interested to figure out uh, risk factors for people to uh, like, what are the risk factors that certain people are more likely to convert from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease? And overarching research question is, uh, can we identify a group of individuals at the very greatest risk of conversion to AD? And we wanna leverage the longitudinal data we have on people uh, with MCI. And um, we are interested in checking the learning effects in the four different cognitive domains, memory, executive functioning, uh, language, and visual spatial abilities. And the hypothesis is um, for people with really no or uh, negative learning effects as shown as the decrement in cognitive abilities over time or little improvement compared to others, 
maybe at a higher risk of conversion from MCI to AD. And here, uh, learning effects are quantified by the latent change score on the cognitive um, batteries. And therefore, the, the psychometric question of this research focus really is how to obtain accurate estimate of learning effects, because everything is latent and we know that as Roy mentioned yesterday, um, we need to take into account measurement errors. And when you look at change scores, change scores is notoriously um, um, bad with measurement errors because measurement error aggregate over time. Uh, so how are we going to separate signals, the, the meaningful change from noise, the measurement error? And here is a little bit background uh, of any data because that is pertinent to our um, psychometric model. Um, here we work with two study cohorts. One is the any one and the other is the any two and go. And the two study cohorts are collect uh, had data collection in different um, time frame. So any started data collection around 2004 and ended around 2010. And any go and two started around 2009 and 20. 16. Um, and they have, I believe, different inclusion and exclusion criteria for, for recruitment. So these two study cohort, we cannot assume them to come from the same population. So we have, psychometrically speaking, we have to treat them as two separate populations. And in addition, we are dealing with uh, repeated measure data. Um, and this is a simple graph illustrate um, the study design. So under any one, we have baseline and six month follow up. And at any two and go, we also have baseline data and six month follow up. Just a disclaimer that uh, any data actually collect follow up people up to three years. But for this particular research question, we only focus on baseline and six month follow up. And the rationale is uh, we want to use the, the repeat measure data to quantify learning effect. And we want to then use learning effect as a predictor of potential um, conversion. And we are thinking of from drug companies perspective, they cannot wait for years and years to figure out who are those patients that are at highest risk of conversion. So instead, we think six months is an OK period of time to wait um, so that um, if we can quickly identify those patients who are at higher risk of conversion. So we only look at baseline and six month data. So we didn't look at um, beyond the six month data. And in terms of psychometric analysis, so traditional analysis um, only use a fraction of data for calibration and then assume the item parameters as known um, and free of error and carry those item parameters forward in some uh, in subsequent analysis. So uh, as showing this uh, graph, basically using a fraction of data from any one baseline data and use that to calibrate um, item parameters. So using single time point and then single any study cohort and use so-called fixed parameter calibration in subsequent analysis. And fixed parameter means that once those item parameters are calibrated, from any one baseline data, then they are carried forward as if they are true parameters. So we ignore the estimation error in them. Uh, that's the previous analysis. And of course, psychometrically, there are some limitations such as small sample size, because we don't take into account the subsequent data collection that are available. And also it ignores the residual correlations of the same items given repeatedly. Um, so therefore, we, are, we propose um, a more advanced analysis, uh, which we call this multiple group to tier model, MGTT. And I will elaborate what this is in just a moment. And due to uh, the complexity of this model, so we resort to Bayesian tools. So we use this Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm that all of you had a chance to run it um, yesterday afternoon. Um, so, but even when we implement this MCMC on this uh, multiple group two tier model, we encounter some challenges. Uh, again, uh, there are some data sparsity due to missingness and also due to the complexity of the model, this concurrent calibration, which means we calibrate this integrated model, this MGTD model in just one round. 
um, sometimes doesn't converge. Mm -hmm. So we also uh, resort to a staged estimation approach, which again, I'm gonna elaborate. And that's really uh, capitalized on the advantages of Bayesian approaches. Because as Roy mentioned yesterday, like he used the term uh, yesterday's posterior today's prior. So the Bayesian approach can really take into account uh, the entire posterior distribution of the parameters. So we don't discard any information and we take into account the estimation errors in stages. So when we use staged estimation in a Bayesian framework, we don't discard any information and we can incorporate measurement error, estimation error of those parameters from earlier stage into the next stage. And again, uh, the question is, will the change score obtained in a proposed analysis be more predictive of conversion from MCI to AD compared to the traditional approach? Because um, arguably our proposed approach is much more complex and we wonder whether it's worth or the hassle to go through those advanced analysis, whether we can gain something out of it. And here are some of the uh, data collection design, like the battery design from Adney. Again, I'm only scratching the little surface of Adney data. Uh, and uh, David is gonna elaborate that much more in detail next. So this is the language batteries. And uh, we know that language battery contains uh, different subscales measuring different facets of language. And also uh, the any one, any two, and goal uh, may contain different items. But of course, there are some common items in across two cohorts serving as anchors to help establish the scale across multiple groups. Um, and also there are common items across repeated measures to help establish a longitudinal scale. But when common items are used repeatedly, not only will they serve as anchors to establish this longitudinal scale, but also it introduces residual correlation because it's the same item administered over time. So there are some intrinsic connection among them. And psychometrically, we need to account for those residual correlations as James mentioned yesterday um, when he introduced the bifact model. And this is the any memory design, and that's even more complex uh, because uh, so th the first column is the any baseline, any one baseline, and then any one follow up, and then any two and goal baseline, any two and goal follow up. And you see the design is complex because there's not a lot of, a lot of overlap between the baseline and follow up um, uh, data collection, but there is a lot of overlap between any one and any two. Um, at different time points. So the reason that I illustrate this uh, data collection design is to show you that the psychometric um, analysis approach will need to be slightly tuned to the different data collection design just due to the uniqueness of the data collection design. And this one is the exact functioning batteries. And the same items are given across two cohorts and also repeatedly. Um, but then there are some items uh, like the first, uh, th those items, you see they share the same clock method. And because of that, of course, the bifactor model was used because uh, the, uh, the nuisance factors are introduced to account for those items sharing the same method of using the clock. Now, uh, let me talk about this multi multiple group two tier model, and it is built upon this graded response model. And um, now I'm trying, I, I have some equations in the slides and I will work through those notations as, um, as slowly as possible, okay. So this is the graded response model because we are dealing with ordinal uh, response data. Um, and James talked about this great response model yesterday. And in, in statistics, that's the cumulative logic uh, regression model with proportional odds, um, if, I, if I say it correctly. Um, so, but psychometricians call it great response model. And it's based on this boundary response curve, which is the probability of uh, a person I responding to item J, YIJ, larger than or equal to a certain response category K that follows this logistic regression model, uh, where this AJ here is the discrimination uh, of item J. And here, this can actually expand into multidimensional case. If we were to analyze the different cognitive domains or together, 
this theta would be a vector, vector of cognitive abilities. And then this A could be a vector of discrimination. And then this DJ, D sub J K minus one is the threshold parameter for item J. And for an item with say five response categories, there will be four threshold parameters. And after defining the boundary response curve, then the gray response model is actually the difference model. It's called a difference model because the probability of choosing a certain response option is equal to the difference between two boundary response curves. So eventually we have something like this on the right here. And this graph is called the category response curve for the item, for a single item. And here, this is just one example item with a certain discrimination and a threshold parameter. And because this item has four response categories, so the threshold parameter actually is a three-dimensional vector. And uh, this curve basically tells us the probability of choosing each response option as a function of your latent trait. So say this latent trait, if it's the language proficiency, then as you move along the continuum, you can draw the vertical line here, and then you can tell, okay, when somebody is really low in language proficiency, they're more likely to choose the first category of this item. If you move along, if somebody with really high um, latent trait, then they are more likely to choose the last response option. So this give you a, give us a good visual of how each item functions. Now, based on this um, greater response model, um, we use the so-called multiple group two-tier model, and it's a bifactor model, and uh, it's a multiple group bifactor model essentially. And if you compare uh, the the equation from here to here. Uh, again, this is the boundary response curve. The difference, there's a couple of differences. First, we introduce this eta, eta ij, which is a nuisance factor for item j, assuming this item j is repeatedly administered. So for the repeated administration of item j, that, that introduced some residual correlation of this item J over time. And to account for this residual correlation, we introduced this nuisance factor, eta ij. And again, because it's a bifactor structure, we assume this eta ij follows a standard normal distribution and is uncorrelated with any of the remaining main factors. So eta ij's or eta ij's are mutually independent and they are all independent of theta i, which is our main factor, like language proficiency or memory proficiency. And essentially this is a bifactor structure because the nuisance factors are all independent and they are uncorrelated with the main factors as well. Um, there are couple, there are two things I wanna mention here. First, notation wise, I use this theta i sub g here. So the, this is really, this sub G is introduced to show you that um, the, the distribution of theta, oh, there is an echo somehow. The distribution of theta um, can be different for different groups. And uh, this sub G is introduced to, um, to echo this multiple group structure of the model. Because we assume the latent trait distribution do not have to be the same across different groups. And as you saw from the ABNY data collection, ABNY1 and ABNY2 and GO are totally two different populations. So it's, it's not justified to assume that they come from the same population. So we wanna estimate thetas, um, assuming that they, from, they are from different distributions for each group. And second is um, for A's and D's, you don't see a sub G there. So intrinsically, we assume there is no differential item functioning. So we assume measurement invariance um, of the items over time or over uh, different groups. And that's just a convenient assumption that we use. Uh, in our analysis, we do check that, uh, not very um, systematically, but we do look into those potential measurement non-invariance. Uh, but for now, for the model, we assume those items uh, behave the same. The same items behave the same across time and over different groups. That said, if you look at this lambda j, so those, these are the loadings. This lambda j, g, this is the loading on the nuisance factor. So for the loadings on the nuisance factor, we don't have to assume that they are the same across groups. 
because those loadings are not of our interest to us. We basically introduced the nuisance factor to account for residual dependency of the same items administered over time. But as long as the ACE, the, the loadings on our main factors stay the same over groups or over time, then the thetas, which we are interested in, are on the same scale. So the scale of theta is determined on A's, not on these lambdas. So even if the lambdas differ across groups, it will not affect the scale of theta because eventually we want to extract factor scores from different any cohort and from different time points to be on the same scale. So, but constraining those lambdas to be the same over groups is too strong of an assumption. And we don't want to have that strong assumption such that the model doesn't fit the data well. So we want to relax that assumption, but still the thetas will be on the same scale. So those are a few points that I will make here, like assumptions. We assume all items function the same for all people without diff. And then uh, for lambdas, it allows for better flexibility. So we, um, and it will not affect the scale of main factors. And this is an illustration, a graphical illustration of uh, this uh, longitudinal model with correlated residuals, but it's a single group uh, two tier model. And for group one, for example, I know this uh, graph is a little busy here. So let me, <laughs> so, so the, those are the responses. And for exact, exactly functioning, we have nine items given over time. Uh, so this is the nine items in the first time point and the same nine items in the second time point. And then because they are the same items given repeatedly, repeatedly, so we need to introduce nine nuisance factors, one for each item. And each nuisance factor load on the same items given twice, okay? And then the main factor that we are interested in here is the exact executive functioning uh, ability. So this is the main factor. And uh, those are all the items here. And that's for time one. And then this main factor for time two. And of course, these two main factors are correlated over time. And in addition to that, we know that five items I think four, five, five items load on this clock method. Again, that's a nuisance factor. Um, and this clock method at time one and time two are also correlated. Okay. It's just a design. Um, there are two things we need to fix in order to fix the scale. Because again, IRT model is in intrinsically indeterminate and we want, yeah, we want to establish the scale. Yeah. So why one to Y8 are both time points, but then Y9 becomes Y18 was something about- Oh, oh yeah, 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 sorry. I think there is a typo right. there. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the question is, I think, uh, I forgot to change that. This should be a Y9. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry about the confusion. Can you repeat that? So there's a oh. Y9 at time one and a Y18 time two, but they should be the same. Yeah, yeah, they should. They are the same nine items given twice. Other questions? Yeah, Paul. So, um, huh. Great. This is going terrific. For people new to this, you've seen my factor models with the secondary factors like the clock methods factor below or to the right hand side if we're doing them vertically. Yeah. This is the same thing. Yeah. It's still a secondary factor, it's just depicted above. Yeah. So the picture looks a little different, but it's the same exact relationships. Yes. Yes, exactly. Thanks, Paul, for clarification. So it's the same by factor structure in a sense that the clock method is uncorrelated with the exact functioning factor. And the clock method is also uncorrelated with any of the lower residual factors. And also all those EDAs are uncorrelated. So they are independent of each other. They're also independent of the exact functioning and they're also uh, independent of the clock method. So the only correlation among factors are really those uh, exactly functioning factor over time 
and also the clock method over time. And then can, can you explain again these eight is at the bottom and why there's ones on Yeah, the yeah, bottom? yeah, I'm getting to that. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, first I wanna mention, we have to fix the scale of the executive functioning at time one for group one, and also the clock method uh, at time one for group one, just to fix the scale. And remember for group two, those are freely estimated. Cause again, group one and group two share the same items. So the common items help to link the scale. And in terms of those uh, EDAs, um, in, the, in the model, we say that uh, we assume those ETAs are from a standard normal distribution because that's just the bifactor structure setup. We assume the nuisance factors follow standard normal distribution. The variance is fixed, and then we can freely estimate lambda here. Okay, but we did a little bit trick in our model uh, because here we only have two time points. So for each ETA, there are only two items load on this particular residual factor. And we know that in SEM, when you only have two items loading on one factor, the model is not determinant. Because if you have only two observed variables, you only have one covariance, and then uh, you can only estimate one parameter. So in that sense, we have to constrain the loadings uh, to be equal. So say we have to constrain this loading and this loading to be equal, just for, for the model to be identified. And when we estimate the model, of course, we use M plus to estimate model in M plus, we can set equality constraints, say two loadings are equal. But when we use MCMC M plus, uh, we cannot um, change the prior of the loadings. So the priors of the loadings have to be normal distribution. It can, we cannot constrain that to be a truncated normal, for example, to allow the loadings to be non-negative. So when you have the same loadings, they could be both positive and they could be both negative and the correlation is the same. So say if you have the loadings of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, the correlation between the two items would be 0.25. And if you have the loadings both be negative 0.5, the correlation is still 0.25. So basically the signs are still indeterminate. So in MCMC, we really wanna have a truncated normal prior so that we constrain the loadings to be non-negative so that we define, identify the model. But in M plus, unfortunately, we cannot change the, the, the type of the prior. So we can, uh, we can change the prior means and variances, but we cannot change the prior to be to from normal to truncated normal. So we cannot work around that. But instead, there is a little bit trick that Rich brought up in, during our group meetings. So instead of estimating the loadings, we can actually estimate the residual variances. So that's the same thing. Because you remember if we estimate the two loadings and the loadings are constrained to be the same, we estimate just one parameter. And instead of estimating the loadings, we fix the loadings to be one and estimate residual variances. So that resolves this sign indeterminacy problem. So that's why what you saw here, we constrain the loadings to be one. And then instead of having ones here, we estimated those residual variances. Totally great. So if you are new to this stuff and you have questions about what you're seeing on this slide, this is a terrific time to raise those. Yeah. Question. Okay. Are there brave people who are? I think there is a hand raised. Okay. All right. I'm sure this is a stupid question I'm asking anyway. So, from time point one to time point two here, how are you anchoring? It doesn't seem like it's being anchored on any items here. Am I, am I just completely missing? Oh, uh, it's not showing in this graph, but uh, the items are the same items. So actually the anchoring, the, the loaded here are the same. Okay, but are you freely estimating with both time points or are you yeah, I'm, them to be the same? Yeah, I'm freely estimating all the item parameters, but constraining the item parameters to be the same over time. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm sure you went over this and I just missed it. What's the triangle with the one? What does that node represent? 
Oh, that is just a constant to tell us the mean and uh, the mean is zero and the variance is one. So, so basically that's a note that's a, a typical graphic notation for path diagram for SEM model. Just uh, the constant. Just a quick question. It looks like you constrained some of the loadings on the bottom to one and not the others, and I'm not sure if that's oh, the site noted it. Uh, they, they're all constrained to one. Yeah, uh, I think we, I can, uh, yeah, I'm not a really artistic person, so <laughs> the graph is not very pretty looking, but there's dot a dot here it means that all so of those two all the way across and then you're yeah. estimating the, the variances. Yeah. These talks, by the way, are in the shared box. There's a folder called talks. Mm -hmm. So this graphic would be something you could refer to uh, on your machine and see all of, like, I can't see the little lips and stuff, yeah. but they're there. Maybe I missed this point, but what does this arrow mean? And like, where is had it? Like, what does that mean? The the arrow? Yeah. Um, and the direction of it. Yeah, so that I think that's a typical factor analytic model where the factors will govern the item responses. So I think James mentioned that a little bit in his talk about reflective factor. That's different. So that's uh, from the observe observations to the factor. But here, this is a factor analytic model. When you write it down, it's actually conditioning on the factors we have the observed item responses. So the arrow is pointing from the factor to the actual item responses. And what does loading mean? The loading, uh, so that's really just a slope in the regression sense. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, thanks for this talk. How, so if you believe that Y1 to Y9 are all the same across time point one and time point two, how does this not and you're freely estimating the parameters for uh, for say y one and uh, at time one and time two, but you're you're fixing them to be the same over time. How does this model differ from a model in which maybe I stack my data so that I have a, a longitudinal data, but I have y one all in one column, et cetera, et cetera. And then I have one, Factor for executive functioning, one factor for one by factor for clock drawing. How would this model compare to a model like that? What would you get out of it that's different? Yeah, I'm trying to picture the model you described in mind. I, I, um, so basically, what you say is we don't have these two factors over time, we just have one factor over time, but then we don't have a change score. So you just assume there is a single factor that governs the responses from both time one and time two. So you don't have a change score, but you've got, you can estimate scores at, uh, at uh, time one for this uh, person, and then at time two for this person. And then if you want to, you can reshape it to Y, and then you can make a change score. Uh, so when you stack, you mean stack the, uh, the data from different time point in a long format or stacking the data from different cohorts? Uh, time points. Time points. Let's assume we're just doing one cohort longitudinal for now. Uh-huh. Um, yes, but when you only have one factor that load onto the responses over time. So basically we have 18 item responses per person here. Uh -huh. um, so you are saying that we can have one factor that load on all 18 item responses? Well, it's only nine item responses because mm -hmm. you've got time one and time two. And yeah, the time one and time two, people's responses are correlated because it's the same people. Yeah. But it's only nine tests that are given. Uh, that's exactly the model we are fitting right now. So we have two factors and uh, the... It's the same factor. It's the factor. So we have a factor that load on the list my items from time one, and then the factor from the, uh, load on the responses from time two. Okay. Maybe we can draw your model. Thanks. Uh, I think there there is another question. <laughs> 
All right, so you're showing an executed function. What about um, if you have different items like where you showed earlier for language or memory? How would the model change? That's a great question. Uh, so I think if you come to our memory uh, work group, I will show you how we did that. We actually did that in stages because it's pretty complex and items don't overlap. I mean, uh, here, the nine items, they do not have to be exactly the same nine items given over time. So maybe you can have nine items here and then 12 items there and there's nine overlap. And then you just introduce nine nuisance factors, but then there may be some additional items here that do not overlap. So as long as there are some anchor items over time and over different groups, that will help establish the scale. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm to SCM newbies. Can you explain what the eta's are? And okay. you mentioned that chain scores are in this model. Where exactly are the chain scores? That's a good question. The change score is not uh, shown here, but if you think about it, the change score is actually this theta zero one two minus theta zero one one. So the notation is complex. Uh, the superscript one and two here denotes the time point. Okay, so the superscript one denotes the time point one, superscript two denotes time point two. And since we have two groups, so that's why I have a subscript. But then Sorry, but if you're constrained those factor lengths to be the same, wouldn't the change score be zero? Uh, no, no, because the actual responses are different. So the loadings are the same means the items behave the same over time. And then what are the eta's? So those are the, are the nuisance factors introduced to account for this residual dependency. So we, we, some, we uh, in a sense that we don't need those nuisance factors, you can just, put a double arrow between y1 and y1 here. You can also put a double arrow there too. That's the same thing. So in actually in M plus, if you use a weighted least square um, moving um, the WIS MV method, you use this P width function and P width actually just uh, estimate the residual correlation. So you don't need to introduce the nuisance factors. This is just an, we introduce it because um, um, Parameterization is much cleaner here because you see from here, we introduce this nuisance factor to account for residual dependency, but you can actually directly correlate them in SEM framework. Yeah. Hi, this yeah. is going great. Yeah. Thank you for taking our questions. Yeah. My question is about the mu11 and mu01. Why are those shown with the square? Oh, which. Oh, yeah. oh, I think, yeah, uh, no, that's not a square. That's um, uh, the second time point. Got it. Yeah. Uh, I, I know the notation uh, is pretty busy here because we have two groups and we have two time points. So the superscript is really for second group. Oh, sorry, second time point. And then the subscript is for groups. And I don't show group two uh, picture here. And uh, group two picture is exactly the same except some notational changes. We actually, again, do some quality control check. Um, and because of the discussion, I see a lot of people are thinking when we introduce these nuisance factors, will the model drastically change that the scale shift all of a sudden to something that is totally different. We had the same doubt too. So um, we, uh, we did some checks. So for instance, we are comparing the left-hand side of the model to the right-hand side. The data is exactly the same, but on the left-hand side, you see the orange boxes. So basically we pull together only the baseline data, but it's a multiple group structure. So we just use a multiple group grade response model. And then on the right-hand side, we use any one data. So we ignore the multiple group structure, but focus on the longitudinal structure, the yellow highlighted boxes. So we, have, we compare these two different models, uh, the, multiple group uh, grade response model. Yeah, again, so when we compare these two models, the anchor point is the ADNI-1 baseline data. And for ADNI-1 baseline data, we fix the mean and variance of theta to be zero and one respectively to, to fix the scale. So basically these two different approaches should give us similar results because they, um, they are anchored at the same point. 
based on this any one baseline data. And the results are what uh, pretty much what we expect when we compare these two approaches. So any one baseline item parameters across these two calibrations are close, and if any one baseline theta estimates from these two calibrations are close. And model convergence is good. Um, PPP values, those are the uh, Bayesian uh, model fit indices. So the posterior predictive p-values are good. Um, so this gives us assurance that uh, by introducing these nuisance factors using this longitudinal model won't give us something that is totally different from uh, more traditional approaches. But also we compare, like then uh, we wonder, uh, can we get some statistical evidence to show that introducing these correlated residuals will help us improve model fit? So we use uh, some traditional SEM fit indices, such as chi-square difference test for nested models, uh, CFI, TRI, and RMSEA for absolute model fit indices. So those are not available in um, Bayesian approach. So we take advantage of the traditional um, a way to release the square estimation. So because M plus, uh, we can estimate models either in way to least square or MCMC, but we cannot estimate the, the MGTT, the, mul uh, the multiple group two tier model in uh, using the weighted least square because it doesn't handle missing data very well. And when you pull data from two different cohorts together, of course, there are some a lot, there are a lot of systematic missingness due to the item design. Um, so this is just really for, uh, checking uh, the, the two different models with and without correlated residuals for each cohort separately. Um, the, this is a big table, and uh, here I only show the language and exactly function domain, but we also have done this for memory and visual spatial domains as well. And for each data set, any one, any two, and goal, we compare the model without residual versus model with residual, and we report absolute fit indices from uh, weighted least square estimation and also the chi-square difference test uh, for nested models because the model without residual is nested within the model with, res with uh, uh, residuals. So as you, sh as you see here, by introducing these correlated residuals, all fit indices tend to um, turn out to be better. Like we have a higher CFI, higher TRI, and smaller RMSEA, and the chi-square difference test turns out to be all significant. The PPP values, of course, is not quite sensitive. Uh, so it, it seems that even the model without residuals, the PPP value doesn't capt uh, capture that. Uh, so it's not quite informative in terms of model comparison. Okay. Um, and next, I mentioned about the actual implementation of this model using MCMC, uh, we encountered some challenges uh, numerically due to model convergence. So we came up with two different approaches. One is of course concurrent calibration. So we just fit the model integratively as a whole uh, and let the algorithm um, estimate all model parameters. But sometimes when the model is too complex in a sense that we have too many using factors, too many residual correlations, the model doesn't converge. Uh, and we resort to this three-stage estimation approach. Um, and here three is just an artificial number because we have two cohorts. Um, and in our paper, we actually expand it to five-stage estimation when we have three cohorts, for example. Um, and for three-stage estimation, the first stage is really just using the longitudinal model with correlated residuals on any one data. We know that from this model fit indices, uh, we need to include correlated residuals. So we fit that on this one cohort of data. And then in stage two, that really capitalized on the, uh, the beauty and advantages of Bayesian approach. So we use informative priors in um, on any two data. Basically, if it is the same items shared across any one and any two, because we have the posterior distribution of those item parameters from our stage one, and we use those posterior distribution as the prior in our stage two estimation. And because the posterior distribution is so concentrated for those item parameters in stage two estimation, we don't have to use any constraints. So we don't need to constrain the theta distribution to be fixed at all in stage two, because those informative priors help us identify the scale of the model. So in stage two, we use informative priors. 
And then in stage three, because eventually we still want the factor scores from any one and any two and go to be on the exactly same scale. So even if we use informative priors in stage two, those parameters, those item parameters still change a little bit, although not much at all because the prior is so tight, but they're not exactly the same. So stage three is really re-anchor them. So we use fixed parameter calibration on any one data again, because once those parameters, those same items, the parameters of the same items are updated in, in stage two, then we use the updated parameters again in any one analysis. And this stage three is really to make sure the factor scores from MD1 are on exactly the same scale as MD2 and GO. And in the paper, we also mentioned this multi-stage estimation because reviewers ask us how are we going to generalize this idea to more than two cohorts. So if we have three cohorts, we can do the same thing. So we estimate the longitude in the model on cohort one using formative priors um, on the common items in cohort two analysis. And then if the cohort three has some shared items between cohort one and cohort two, of course, we use informative priors on those common items in cohort three analysis. And once we do that, then we transfer those um, common item parameters back to cohort one and cohort two to make sure that the factor scores extracted from all those cohorts are on exactly the same scale. So once, sorry, so once we get those change scores from these more advanced models, uh, we wanna get validity evidence. We wanna get some predictive evidence to show whether it's worthwhile to go through this route to get this change score. Because if you recall our research question, we want to see if uh, this change score, the learning effect could predict conversion. And we have the, the the outcome is time to conversion because we, we see how long it took for people from MCI to convert from AD. Of course, some people never convert. So we use the survival analysis, the Cox proportional hazard model, um, and we use the change score as predictors. And instead of using the raw change score, we use k-means clustering and class people into five categories and use those categories as indicators um, in the Cox proportional hazard model because the result is much cleaner and easier to interpret. So basically, um, we classify people into five categories. So uh, a lot worse change, a little worse change, a little positive change, somewhat change, and a lot of better. So there are five different categories based on change scores. And the this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, the left-hand side is from the traditional approach when we calibrate items from just one cohort, one time point. Um, and this right-hand side is the, the advanced approach. And you see much wider separation of Kaplan-Meier curve for the five categories. So that means the change scores from our advanced approach can better separate people uh, from uh, conversion. So if, if someone with a lot worse change in memory, like their memory uh, ability decline, dramatically over time, you see a dramatic separation of Kaplan-Meier curve, the survival curve. Okay. And if we look at the uh, actual estimate, again, the left part is from the traditional approach and the, the right part is from the Bayesian approach. Um, and here we show the hazard ratio and confidence interval and p-value. So hazard ratio, if it is close to one, that means there's no difference between the different categories using, we use category three as our baseline. So as our re reference category and all the other four categories are compared to category three. Um, so in a traditional approach using memory domain as an example, only the first category show up as significant because the hazard ratio is significantly different from one. Um, so that means somebody in the a lot better category will have a hazard ratio of 10th of somebody in the a little better category to convert. Okay. Whereas if we use uh, the Bayesian approach, the, we have a lot more significant categories. So more, much more signals. And yeah. So I really love that you're calling the thing on the left, you know, the traditional standard way. Because those are our factor scores that we've developed. So that's the equivalent of adding memory stuff. So it's already a modern psychometric score on the left. 
So this is showing times more explanatory power to be able to predict who's going to develop dementia from six months on with the change in memory as the same items went in here. So there's tremendous payoff for the complexity of this Bayesian model where we got oodles more that we're predicting just with changes in memory by itself uh, when we're comparing what she's calling standard and I would say a, a well, sophisticated <laughs> modern psychometric approach that's the best I could do without the Bayesian approach. So there's tremendous payoff. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So I will call it modern approach and modern, modern approach. <laughs> I'm going to call it traditional. That's great. I'd yeah. love to be the like yeah. standard. Yeah. By which we compare. Yeah, thanks. And um, another um, example is from the exactly functioning domain, and we see the same thing, much better separation on the right-hand side and much more um, uh, significant uh, categories on the right-hand side. Um, so again, this attests to our hypothesis that by using a more sophisticated approach, we can better separate a meaningful change from noise. So um, we can have better explanatory and predictive power. I think our time is up. So I, I have some simulation study to show, but I don't know if everybody wants to see that. And I don't want to bore you with that. Uh, so basically, we run some simulations again, because in the real data, there is so much we know about. Uh, we don't know the truth. Whereas in simulations, that's what we as methodologists do all the time. Uh, running simulations is like psychologists running experiments. So we know the truth and we wanna compare our estimates with the truth and see how close they are. And we show that by using this more advanced um, psychometric approach, we can better recovery. We can get a better recovery of change scores. So I will just skip that. And um, just uh, jump to the final conclusion. So. Basically, this longitudinal grade response model with correlated residuals is recommended uh, for a single group. And if you have two groups or multiple groups, you use this multiple group two-tier model. And concurrent calibration is recommended if the model converges, because that's just much easier to run in the sense that you don't have to go through these stages. Uh, whereas in some cases, if the concurrent calibration doesn't converge, of course, this three-stage method is a useful alternative. But implementation-wise, um, you need to be really careful to put in those posteriors as priors manually. So that's it. And um, if you're interested, we can share the draft with the group. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Great. So I think that second bullet point is really interesting. So I think for me, the takeaway from this um, was Bayes stuff can fit really complicated models. But there's some models that are so complicated, even Bayes can't fit, fit it all at once. And that's no problem. Break it into smaller parts and run it that way with this sequential design and update things in a theoretically justified way. And you're still miles ahead of where you would be without these tools. So that huge payoff, the memory, go back up to the memory results. Do I have, I think it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That one. So this huge payoff of being able to predict who's gonna um, convert to Alzheimer's disease, this is requiring the breaking it up into stages piece because the memory one mm. has this hugely complex de design that we talked about in prior iterations of Friday Harbor, where between baseline and six months, you have complete different version of the two wordless learning tasks that are embedded within this. So they have different flavors. They have uh, flavor A and flavor B. And they have a third version of the ADAS cog that they did at the third time point. Like it's an incredibly complicated design. So we're able to estimate everything in one massive, huge Bayesian model that could be drawn perhaps, but would be even more complex than the thing she drew here. That was the much simpler case. And that's supposed to be like a little joke. That's not a simple model yes. of a correlated bifactor structure um, that she did 
for the uh, executive functioning domain. So it's a very, very complicated model and it didn't work. And so instead of throwing up our hands, um, instead of them throwing up their hands, because no one's gonna accuse me of doing this model, right? So what they did was to break it down into meaningful bite-sized chunks and estimate each one of those in a coherent way and cleverly update things so that everything's on the same metric. And this is that payoff. Hang on. Thanks for an awesome presentation. It's so good. Thank you. I was, we talked about this very briefly yesterday when we think about the memory domain in particular. How is constraining the weights to be the same across time handling learning effects, like practice effects? Is that something that you need to deal with separately from this? Because I almost assume, and this could be a bad assumption, I know there's a lot of people in the room who've done a lot on practice effects here, that that second time point weight would be different because it should be because they've learned a way strategically to approach the problem of neuropsychological tests that they didn't have the first time around. So I'm just curious if maybe there's not a good answer, but just kind of speculate on yeah, should yeah. we be thinking about that in the way that we're modeling this or not? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, yes, I, you can't. Sorry, huh? Oh, the question is uh, how would constraining the item parameters to be the same over time take into account? the learning effect, because arguably you would think the items will become easier the second time when people have already learned it. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that again comes to the indeterminacy of the IRT model. So if you allow items to become easier, then you don't have to sit, you don't have to anchor unless you go through the route of doing the deep analysis to see which items actually stay the same over time. But on the other hand, I think practice effect or learning effect, you can argue it as the items stay the same. But if if the people really perform better on the item, they could be have the better proficiency. So the proficiency increase. So if we constrain the items to be the same over time, because we are not comparing people to an absolute cutoff. We are comparing people relative to each other. So basically we are comparing people with a little improvement on, on, on the performance over time versus people with a lot of improvement over time. So maybe everybody has some learning effect, some practice effect over time, but some people with not risk of conversion have much higher learning effect versus people with potential of conversion. So um, they are still on the same playing field. So we are comparing relatively. Some people are doing better than the others. So that could be an argument why we consider them to be the same. But of course, um, statistically or psychometrically, uh, we should do a more diligent work of checking each item uh, uh, like against diff and see whether they stay the same over time. It's a great answer. I have a correlated answer, I hope, which is, what we were trying to do here wasn't to characterize the underlying level of memory. What we were trying to do was to have a spectrum of how much did people change between time one and time two. And they range from a lot better to a lot worse. And then to see how much those categories were related to risk of conversion. And I can't tell you whether a lot better is that the person's actual underlying memory function got better or they just learned how to do things. I don't, I don't, we don't have enough data or modeling. That wasn't the, the thing we were setting out to study. We can't differentiate them. But when we sort people based on, did your scores improve a ton for memory or did they get a ton worse for memory or stay about the same? When we did that with the Bayesian structure, this is what we got. So if you might do something different with trial one, trial two deltas, with learning effects, whatever we're gonna call that thing. Uh, if you were trying to do something with the relationship between underlying memory ability and something else, or if you were trying to comment on um, sort of the natural progression of memory within a person over time, if you're trying to do that sort of life course thing, but that wasn't our goal. We were trying to do this risk factor thing. So you might model it differently if you had a different question. 
And there is this indeterminacy thing where we can't differentiate somebody who's truly better from somebody who just learns better. And I'm not sure I know, like, mm. that gets into the philosophy of what is it we're looking at when we're looking at the same person with the same items twice. Cool? Yeah. Um, so you looked at several different kinds of domains. Um, how did the MCI to AD conversion differ across the domains? Yeah, that's a memory question for me. I don't quite remember. I think the reason I show these two domains uh, because they are using different approaches. So for the memory domain, we use this three-stage estimation method. And for the exact functioning, we use concurrent calibration. So I just want to show that either way, we get a better signal. But I think all four domains, we tend to have better differentiation. Um, but visual, spatial, I don't remember. But well, I... it's such a slam dunk. So for <laughs> visual, spatial, it was a mess with standard, our usual way of doing things because it's not a lot of indicators. But with the Bayesian stuff, there, like we could show even uh, with visual, spatial, if you've got changes that you sort like this with the Bayesian approach, we were able to show a uh, distinction. And the other implication of your question was how did it differ? So it's the same people with all four domains, right. the same number of people, like it's the same number of conversions. We're modeling the same conversions with the four different change scores. And they're not all that correlated with each other. It wasn't the same people who were getting a lot worse in memory, who were getting a lot worse in everything else. So we put them into, and we here means Doug, because he did all the analyses. So we, she developed the Bayesian scores and then shipped them to Doug, who did the Cox model. So we tried them in um, like a big model with all of them together. And uh, several of them were independent of each other, like statistically independent of each other. Well, you'll have to read the paper. <laughs> but it's, it's the general answer is that uh, change in cognition over six months looks like a really useful biomarker of who's going to convert. And the clinical relevance of this, of course, becomes much more when we now have a drug that's pretty toxic that probably will have a label indication for people with NCI. You might want to see them back again and see if they change a lot. And if they do get a lot worse, you might think this might be somebody I would treat with this really toxic drug. And if they get a lot better, mm. their hazard of converting is really low. And you might think this might be somebody I would not treat with a really toxic medication. Cool. What about, uh, do you think you could apply this to cognitively normal individuals or just sex uh, Caveat mTOR, like I would not mm -hmm. use this model because there's no people with normal cognition and the baseline rate of conversion in normal is, is very, very different than the people who not only have MCI, but have amnestic MCI and not only have amnestic MCI, but have amnestic NCI to the point that they're enrolled in ADME as an MCI case. That's a very special, specific group of people. So I'm not sure I'd extrapolate. And I certainly wouldn't say anything about what's going on with normal cognition with that, because we have no idea. We never looked. Just a quick comment. One could take this approach and apply it to cognitively normal people progressing the MCI. This could be a roadmap for doing it. Yes, but we don't know what that would show. Like you could use these sorts of models and arguments to look at that. You might have some power issues because there's not a lot of conversions from normal to MCI that are captured in your life. At least in that. I saw it. I'll come back to you. I'm going to go back here. So I've, I've used a similar approach quite a bit in my own research in multi-stage where you're yeah. estimating factor scores and changes over time and then using those in a survival analysis with some kind of endpoint. Um, I have to say the differentiation between the Kaplan Meyer curves yeah. was uh, kind of shocking. <laughs> um, it's so it's so strong. And so I am hypothetically speaking, if you go back to your initial stage with factor models, yeah. um, if you had flat priors. If you had the exact same model, and even in a factor analytic kind of theorization, the factors should be error free, right? Mm. So I'm just wondering when you're pulling those scores out, if you looked at correlations between scores that were um, extracted from models that were non Bayesian versus scores that were extracted from the Bayesian approach, and what the correlation might be between. 
yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think we, yeah, we did. Um, the correlation, if you look at individual, uh, the factor scores at individual time points, they seem to correlate highly. But if you look at change score, of course, the change, uh, the, the correlation drops. Okay, and, and I think here we are not saying it is because of the Bayesian approach that is magical. I, a Bayesian approach gave us a tool for model estimation. I think it's the model itself that uh, captures the, the nuances in the data that can help us better differentiate meaningful change from noise. So for instance, we actually find the loadings, the variances of the, the residual variances to be pretty substantial. So ignoring that residual variances will distort the factor score over time. Really interesting talk. Uh, let me just I'll limit my questions uh, to a clarification about the, the factor score estimation. So after the calibration, you then get um, an estimate for each person at their baseline and six months, and then do the yeah. subtraction between those. Yes. And are those point estimates that come out? Are you looking at? Have you looked at any of the variability, posterior standard deviation of a person's factor score, or that was like, no, we're just going to use the point, take the subtraction, uh, and it's our lives. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for the real data analysis, because we, we, we don't use the standard error of the factor scores in the survival analysis, because right. we just run the survival analysis the traditional way. But in the simulations, we do look at the standard error. And of course, using the, the, uh, the advanced model model way, the standard error drops. Uh, and one, one point I didn't mention is because I didn't go over the simulations, the concurrent calibration actually give us slightly higher standard error compared to staged estimation. And that is not just surprising because in the concurrent calibration, the model is so complex. Of course, um, there is some estimation instability that contributes to the large standard error. Whereas in, in the staged estimation, uh, the standard error is the lowest in the most complex model. But Regardless, these two approaches give us smaller standard error compared to the, the single method where we just use one time point data, one, one cohort data. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Questions, why is like um, this two approach where you will have the values that are the standard and some people are crossed by different differences? Another question is like in our center, we have you know, people don't come in at the same time. Like they, they have it as a yearly follow up. Some people may come back six months, some people come back for two years. So if they have different time intervals, and then we also apply for this model, is that possible? Is that we do a lot of job time difference, or otherwise we divide the model or help them do that? Yeah, uh, great questions. Uh, for the first one, uh, I think that this is the question. Oh, the first question is uh, when we classify people into these five categories using different change scores, uh, how closely are the, uh, what is the overlap? Um, I don't remember if Doug remembers whether it, he runs concordance between the classifications. Yeah, we use Kappa statistics for that. And yeah. There was some agreement beyond right. what you'd expect by chance, chance yeah. but it wasn't very strong. Mm. And there was a there's like a formal labels applied to different levels of kappa. It was like the second lowest yeah. agreement. So there is some agreement, but not a whole lot. Uh, for the second question, uh, I think if the time is different, uh, I know the latent growth curve model. Those type of growth models can take into account different time uh, time uh, gaps between visits. Um, but I don't think the simple repeated measure model can be applied. So you, you would have to use this time varying covariate in the model. And this var time varying covariate could be the gaps between visits. And that would model the data more authentically. Yeah, so um, kudos to Abby for <laughs> rigorously enforcing we've got a visit now and six months go by and we have our next visit. And those are tightly controlled by design. And that allows us to make the assumption that they're exactly at zero and six months and not have to deal with varying time levels for that second visit. 
it also gets to be like a different construct. So what does it mean to have change over two months as opposed to six months? That might be a very different set of type of structures that you need to do that. So it, it gets super complicated very fast if that if the time is rigorously controlled. So um, that's part of the, um, the very careful collection of cognitive data. I didn't mention timing um, and study design as being really important factors for some of the models that we're able to run. Uh, you need a much more complex mm -hmm. model yeah. to model time as an indicator or as, as, a, as a piece of this. Mm -hmm. Terrific questions. Rich, and Ben is definitely going to her watch, and she is correct. Yeah. And I absolutely think we need to <laughs> pause. We should take a break of 15 minutes. And what time is it now? 25. So we'll come back at 40. Great. Thanks so much. Recording.